Okay, um, hopefully you can hear now. <laughs> okay, part C then was to find the potential difference between points A and point B. So what method are we going to use to do that? We could. Uh huh. We already know the it's just it's simply W E we already figured out for B over Q. Okay, so we could also use W E over Q. Either one is gonna be I mean this has two numbers multiplied, this has two numbers divided. So whatever you choose to do. Um, those equations are, are equally simple. So we should get, um, the book tells us that if we do that, we get 7.5 times 10 to the minus 6 volts. Actually, I'll just put in some numbers here. So the E field was 7.5 okay all right so any questions on on this example all right not till tomorrow not till tomorrow it makes sense today it makes sense right now that's all I can ever ask for which one Ten to the minus six. Oh, ten to the sixth. Thank you. Ten to the plus six. So many things were negative. I just got like <laughs> negative happy. All right. So moving along from potential. <laughs> Equal potential surfaces. So we've talked about drawing electric field lines. And so now we get to add to those pictures equal potential surfaces. So an equal potential surface, it sounds very much like the word. It just means that the potential along that surface is constant. Um, and so this should make sense. The electric field decreases with distance. We said that as these electric field lines separate, the electric field is going um, smaller and smaller and smaller. So if we were to draw a line where the electric field is the same around this charge, it would have to be a circle. So everywhere along that circle, the electric field has the same value. Um, and then, so that's, that's called um, the, the equal potential surface, basically. Everywhere along that line, the electric field has the same value. So you can draw these circles anywhere you want, and that would tell you that the electric field is constant along that line. And then it just so happens that the potential is also constant along that line. Um, so um, a couple properties of an equal potential surface. If we were to take a charge and move it along an equal potential surface, so your change in electric field would be zero, then it just, well, well from our equation there, if the electric field, um, if the change in electric field is zero, then your change in um, potential would be zero. It would take no work to move along an equal potential surface. And just it, by definition that makes sense because work is defined by 
the electric field, you know, whether you're moving with the electric field or away from the electric field. But if everywhere you're moving, the electric field stays the same, then the work, um, the work would be zero. Let me rephrase that. Not the electric field staying the same, because the last problem we did, the electric field stayed the same across that whole distance. The, poten the change in potential, I should say, if the change in potential is zero along that line, then your work is zero. Obviously, um, the electric field is also the same, but that's not how we define um, the eco-potential surface. Um, a little caveat here, just or a reminder about the path independence thing. So if we just pick a, a beginning and final um, spot that both land on an equal potential surface, we could move a charge anywhere as long as it started and ended on the same equal potential surface, then the work done would be zero. So that's work in physics land, not work in the real world. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you could, take, you could take an electron, move it all the way to the end of the universe, and bring it back, and as long as it landed back on this line, then the work done would be zero. Weird. But there you go. Um, all right, so this is how we would draw the equipotential surface, surfaces around a positive charge. And the negative charge would have very similar equal potential surfaces because um, it would just, it's also circular. The dipoles, they, um, they really haven't, haven't drawn in much um, further away from those charges. So I'll show you a little bit more of the lines that they have skipped. And this, this is actually going to be really, this is what you're doing in the lab today. You're actually going to be plotting equipotential surfaces with a voltmeter. A voltmeter measures potential. And so you can measure the equipotential between uh, a positive and a negative charge um, if there's the field between them. And we're creating a field by putting water on these charges. And so that transmits current there are going to be like a positive bolt and a negative bolt in a little bath of water. That water allows current to travel, so there's an electric field in your water. And so we know from, we know our electric field lines around a dipole look like this. Okay, so arrows going towards the negative. And then drawing in those um, equipotential surfaces. So we won't be plotting the electric field with the voltmeter. The voltmeter is used to measure the potential. So we can measure the voltage um, at multiple points straight down the middle between them and you should find the voltage is the same. So exactly mid, uh, midline between them, you should measure a straight line where the voltage is constant. And so if we connect those dots, this would be an equal potential surface. If we get really close to this bolt, we should be able to measure a nice little circle. If we put that voltmeter everywhere around this bolt, you should measure the same voltage in a nice little circle. So this would be an equal potential surface. And same with the negative bolt. And then as you get away, then the field is going to start spreading itself out a bit. So it's going to kind of make itself a little oblong. In fact, just to show you what you're going to be measuring versus what you're going to submit. So when you are in lab, you're going to be measuring 
just the equipotential surfaces. So you're going to connect the dots. And this is what your picture is going to look like after you've collected your data. So your dots, this is like ideal, right? So of course your pl plot is never going to look this perfect, um, but it's hopefully going to look close to something like this. And then we can interpolate what the electric field is based on our collected data. So everything in red, you, you actually measured with the voltmeter. And we know that the equipotential, or sorry, the electric field is going to be perpendicular to the, the equipotential surfaces at any given point. So straight across between them, the perpendiculars to all of these equipotential surfaces is a straight line. So in the analysis section of the lab, you're going to have to interpolate the electric field lines just going and saying, well, let's see, this is perpendicular, this is a perpendicular, this is a perpendicular. OK, so that, that you can figure that um, you're basically drawing in what you think the electric field looks like based on the shape of these equipotential surfaces. Okay, so you get the idea. That's what you're doing for the lab. Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll remind you about that, but that's, um, that's the idea. And then this picture here, this shows you if you have two positive charges, we already talked about what the electric field would look like between those. It's gonna try and kind of repel each other. The electric field lines are never gonna cross. The equipotential surfaces, though, they do cross at this point. You're going to get this, this one distance where you get this sort of infinity type symbol. Um, and the weekly online activity four that we're going to hopefully have time for, you'll get to plot um, equipotential surfaces for this scenario on your own. Um, and then the last one, so you can ignore the writing on the next slide. I'm just showing you the picture. This is what the electric field and the equipotential surfaces might look like if you've got a positive conductor and a plate. And so parts, part two of the lab, this is very similar to what we're doing in part two. And part three, you'd actually have two plates. So you should see the electric field is straight through the, between the plates. OK. Um, so examples, you can see these examples, see if there's any ones that we actually want to solve. All right, so we'll do um, examples 23.6 and 23.8, and then 23, well, we'll just see how, we get, how far we get, so. Okay, 23.6 says, by integrating the electric field as in equation 23.17, find the potential at a distance r from a point charge q. So you can ignore what they say um, about the equation 23.17. All we're going to do is I'm going to show you um, how we can integrate um, to find the potential. So this is kind of going back to uh, Saban's question earlier about, you know, if you've got a point charge, how would you actually calculate the potential? So I showed you the integral. We're just going to solve the integral. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a positive charge, the electric field radiates outward from it. And 
And we said last week and the week before, the electric field near point charge is KQ over R squared. Yes. So we know that it gets, it decreases the further we get away. And so our definition for potential, change in potential, was minus the integral of E cosine theta ds. So that was our general form of it. And we gotta use this because we know the electric field changes with distance. And so just like I said earlier, once we put in the equation for E, we know that R is the variable that's changing as we move away. So we'll make this dr instead of ds. Um, and then we want to pick, pick a direction of travel. OK. So typically, we, we say, I mean, like in general, um, we'd say, like, OK, let's start here and move this charge all the way to infinity to figure out how the potential changes until it's all the way to zero, where the electric field is zero. Leanne? Um, isn't it ES cos theta ds? Um, <coughs> so how do I go from ds to dr? I just call it dr. There's no difference between ds and dr. But you're saying that there's supposed oh, to be an okay. s in here? Um, yeah, I have it Let's go back to where we have that integral. Uh, I have, oh, yeah, the one. I have uh, absolute q yeah. uh, integral e cos theta ds. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I mean, maybe you just wrote it down wrong, but there, there should, there's, it's E S cosine theta, but when we make it the integral, the S turns into a DS. Yeah. 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 I can't guarantee that what I wrote on the board is what's on the slide, but that's what it should be. <laughs> um, anybody, I mean, it sounds like what you guys wrote down is what's on the slide? No. No, it's what you What on the board, and there wasn't an extra S? No. Okay, no. all right, well, that's good. I just want to make sure that I correct any typos I put on the board. Um, okay, so um, I guess remember what I said about this negative sign. If we want to just magically get rid of it, all we have to do is just integrate in the opposite direction of the electric field. So what we're doing is we're going to take a positive test charge out here at infinity, and we're going to move it towards this charge Q. So our direction of travel DS is now in the opposite direction of the electric field. So at this point, our electric field vector is going away, and we're going towards. So cosine, what's the angle here? Yeah, cosine of 180. And so cosine of 180 gives us um, what? Negative one, one. negative one, yeah. So this goes to negative one. That cancels the negative out front. And so we don't have to worry about our negative anymore. But what we integrated from was from infinity to zero. Oh, crap. OK, ignore what I just said. <laughs> yeah. Made so much sense when I said it. OK, so I got to read my notes. It says, we do have to integrate from R to infinity because the integral will be undefined at, at infinity. OK. I don't know why that matters. <laughs> I don't know why it matters. 
need to integrate from r to infinity because the integral will be undefined at v equals zero. Well, that's Oh, well, hmm. Oh, at r equals zero. Oh, well, that's just saying we can't integrate from, we can't, okay, never mind. Okay, I'm gonna ignore what I just, <laughs> ignore what I just babbled to myself. Go back to what I had written, okay? <sighs> All right, we're going towards this charge. So our direction of travel is, is um, So it starts at infinity. We're going towards it. Our E field is in the opposite direction. Everything is hunky-dory. Cosine of 180, that gets rid of this sign, plus KQ over R squared dr. OK. We're, well, that, that's, the, that's the caveat here that I need to point out. So we can't integrate all the way to 0 because if we have, if we put um, r equals zero in the denominator, that's undefined. So we're going to go from negative infinity, or going from infinity to some, some distance away that isn't zero. So really, really close. Um, yeah, so I'm going to call this, this radial distance r. So this, this distance out to here is called R. That's where we're stopping. And I put that all in black so you can't see uh, the, the, the video doesn't really pick up other colors very well. So I was trying to stick to black, but now that's hard to see, so. Okay, so we're integrating from infinity to r and that should work okay all right so um, q is the charge that's creating the electric field that's constant k is a constant so those guys are, are able to be pulled out so we've got k q the integral from infinity to r dr over r squared so, calculus fans, what's the integral of dr over r squared? Dave's like, what you, calculus and fans? And you know who you are. You know who you are. Was that Matt? I'm trying to do it in my head here. All right. I think it's easier to write this as r to the negative 2 dr. So um, one third times r to the negative three. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, we add one. So if we add one to negative two, what do we get? Negative one. That's all right. That's all right. So I want to make sure everybody is refreshing those calculus molecules in their brain. Um, okay. <laughs> so so this is this is what we get. We're integrating from negative infinity to r, so infinity to r. So we get minus k q, and then one over r. So our terms of integration, we're going to have one over. Um, Maybe I'll call this big R so that that doesn't look weird. Big R, call this guy big R. And then minus one over infinity. Okay, so what is one over infinity? So now we have minus k q over r is our delta v. So before we go any further, the delta v part. So delta v is um, v final. So v at r minus v at infinity. 
no, yeah, V final minus V initial. Where, whoa, where did that minus go? There it is, let's see. Hmm. Um, okay. I've, I have a sign issue somewhere. Um, so the potential at infinity, so you get so far away that the electric field has no effect. So what would the potential at infinity be, if you had to guess? Zero. 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 Yeah. The camera can't see this whole thing that's going on. Yeah, Dave, can you... Uh, Yeah, I, know, I've, I think there's like this much of the board that gets cut off if we see this part, yeah. Um, so we have VR, so there's some voltage at this distance away, but once we get out to infinity, it's zero volts. Okay, so my problem is that this answer is supposed to be positive. So we should have VR is um, the potential at that radius R is plus KQ over that radius. And so I have a sign issue somewhere. <sighs> Where did it go? I thought we, I thought we evaluate, I thought we evaluated our no, bottom to top. Bottom to top? Yeah, no, top to bottom. I was like, bottom to top. I, I, always, I always integrate from the final to yeah. initial. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's our problem. Well, that's how they ended up doing it. Is they, they, uh, push it, they Yeah, the, well, they're integrating from R to infinity, right? We're, in, we're integrating from infinity to R. And so when they, they're evaluating their integral, then obviously the infinity would come, or their infinity would come first because their integration terms are switched, mm -hmm. right? But we didn't do it that way, so we have to stick with what we did. So when I, I did R to infinity, V final minus V initial, V final minus V initial. We just debated that. <laughs> and I am 95% sure that when we integrate, we evaluate the top term first. If anybody has a calc book that wants to verify that, then I'd be happy to hear um, from your calc book. <laughs> That's not, that's not the problem on my, prop, on my worksheet. So my worksheet, I integrated, I actually integrated from R to infinity, and I don't know why that would, that shouldn't make a difference. So the negative went away, and then they get this. Oh, let's see. Do I have a sign wrong? I have one over... Minus a minus. Oh, minus a minus. Does that? No, that's no. No, that's not. That's not it. But that's that's my that's my typo on my work here. I'm I I add a a typo on my worksheet. So I don't know.
See, the way the book does it is they're integrating from R to infinity, but they don't have a minus sign on their integral. And so they're, I don't know how they're even doing that because this is our, this is our definition of delta V. Um, and so that's how they get a plus in their answer was they just decided to not have a negative on their integral. So, I'm not seeing the, <sighs> well, I'll put that, put a pin in that, because um, I'm not seeing any mathematical error here. I'm not seeing any logical er error. So I'm going to have to go back to the book and see if there's some reason that they don't put a negative on their integral. Um, so I'll come back to that um, after we've had a break. Mathematically, I don't see any error unless you guys, okay, so, all right. Well, let's put a pin in that and come back to it. All right, so let's do the next example, um, 23.8. We have a solid conducting sphere of radius big R and total charge Q and we want to find the electric potential everywhere, both inside and outside the sphere. So we did this last week with electric field. All right, so I'm going to try and remember what it was. So electric field as a function of distance. So anywhere inside here, what is the electric field? Zero. Zero. Zero, yeah. Okay, and then we use Gauss's law to say when we're outside of the conductor, what can we treat that solid sphere conductor as? Like a point charge, yeah. And then what we, def we just had on the board what the electric field due to a point charge is is kq over r squared. So when you're exactly outside and your little r is actually the radius of the sphere, that's where you have your maximum electric field. That's kq over big R squared. And then because this is um, a 1 over r squared relationship, we look at our pattern inverse square that's a down swoopy. So that would be how our electric field looks as our radius increases, as we get further and further away from this guy. So we want to do the same thing for potential. So um, first inside. We want to find the change in potential. Our equation is minus E cosine theta dr. Call it dr since we're also working with a radius here. Um, so what what would you what do you think is going to happen here inside? So we. Yeah, zero, because the electric field anywhere in here, so any two points that we pick, the electric field along those two points would be zero the whole time. So since this term goes to zero, then our change in potential is zero. So that means, so if the change in potential is zero, what does that tell us about the potential? It's the same. It's the, it's the same, yeah. So. If it was 5 volts, it would be 5 volts everywhere inside that conductor. And then outside, And then this, this is basically the same integral we just solved that we have our sine issue for. Um, since the electric field looks like 
the kq over r squared, then the calculation would be identical and we still have our sine issue. Um, so our calculations say minus kq over r, um, but we've got a sine error somewhere. So the actual answer should be plus kq over r. And I'll get the answer to that question after we have a break. Oh, did you? So 1 over, or negative 1 over r, you would need that r should be negative 1 over r. Oh, but I pulled this negative out. If you keep, just keep it inside and then... Okay. And then this becomes positive. And it still, it still becomes a negative. Yeah. That is good. <laughs> okay. I it's got to be, I don't know, I mean, because the, we got rid of the, we, I mean, we, we followed to the letter the physics equation that we derived, which says there, this is a negative, and then we got rid of our negative using the prescribed method, and the book is just using the integral without the negative sign, so I have to go back to the book and see if they've got some sort of logical explanation for why they just decide to not have a negative on this equation. And I'm hoping it's not one of the typical physics hand wavy arguments that just says because we choose not to. That's, I try and not give that explanation for things in this class because those are the things that just turn my brain off when I was in physics. When the teachers were just like, well, we just choose to not use it. And I'm like, you have to have a better answer than that. So I'm gonna try and come up with a better answer than because. Not like the trick right. that you said to do that, to get rid of the Yeah. They, did both, they just got rid of it anyway and didn't integrate that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hoping the book has some, some helpful, useful explanation, but as we know about this book, that's usually not the case. <laughs> so I think that's going to be my, my project for our lunch break. Um, all right. So the last one that I was going to show you is example 2310. Um, and this, yeah, okay, this one's a little bit different because um, this one, this this one we just did is like pretty much identical to a point charge, so that's not all that exciting. Twenty three ten is finding the potential at a distance r from a long line of charge. So this has this ha has a different integral, and here we get to have a dispute with the book about the negative sign again. <laughs> all right. <coughs> Oh, I should have kept all that on the board until, oh well. Someone's got it written down. And on the video. Okay, so example 2310. We're finding the potential at a distance r from a long line of charge with linear charge density lambda. Okay, so it's really kind of difficult when you look at the cross section like this to see how the electric field varies with distance because if we were to draw electric field lines, it looks like they're parallel if we drew them like this. Instead, if we do a, um, like a cross section, then it's going to look a lot more like a point charge. We know that the electric field is decreasing radially around this line of charge. So it is going to go to zero if we go out to infinity.
Okay. So, um, they're just, okay, so the way they choose to integrate is not with respect to infinity, which maybe that'll help. They're going to integrate um, from some, some location outside this point charge A and then go out to some other finite distance away B. So we put our test charge here and we're moving it this direction. That's our, that's our little dr direction. And if we draw our electric field, it's going to be in the same direction. So just for, I guess, just, just to s s kind of go along with the book, I'm going to go along with the book in their direction of integration, but I'm going to use what we defined as our, electri or as our potential equation, which we have a negative in it. Okay, so we're integrating from A to B, just like the book, but we have a minus sign on the integral. And so what's the angle between our direction vector and electric field? Zero. Zero, yeah, so cosine goes to one. And then we need to recall the equation for electric field near a line of charge. Lambda? Lambda. You know, yeah, we need the, yeah, so the lambda is the charge per unit area or unit um, length for lambda equals charge per unit length. Okay, so that's the E field. We put that into our integral. Is there an R in there? Oh, oh, one over R. That's right. That's a full one. Okay. All right. So everything that's constant. What's constant? All right. Lambda over two pi e naught. All right, another fun integral. Do you guys remember the integral of 1 over x? Natural log, natural log of x. Yeah, natural log of x. So all of our constants still out front. And we get natural log of r. And we're evaluating it at from a to b. So ln at B minus LN at A. And there's a little mathy trick here when you subtract natural logs. What happens when you subtract natural logs? It'll be natural log of B over A. Over. Yeah. All right. Again, this is exactly what the book got except the minus sign. So that should be a plus sign. We're still going to, I'm going to tell you after, after lunch. I'm going to have an answer. Um, so, um, yeah, they just, I mean, that's, that's a good final answer. Anywhere outside your um, line of charge, um, your radial distance B is further away than radial distance A, and that would work. Uh, and then in the evaluate section of this, they go inside the wire itself, and then they give you a definition for what the potential would be inside the wire. Um, and so you can see that the ln um, becomes the outside radius 
over whatever internal distance you are from the very center. So basically the same equation applies inside and outside this wire. All right, so on that note, barring the sign issue, <laughs> do you guys have any questions about the last three examples? Okay, why don't we take our lunch break? Um, it's 11.50 now, it's a little early for lunch, um, but it's a good stopping point. So we'll go until 12.20. See you guys back then. All right, and turn this guy off.